I think that uh, people deconstruct because they're wounded. Um, they're looking for things because they're upset. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Good to be here. Hey, thank you so much. Well, listen, I am so excited to have you here today. Today, I want to form uh, perhaps an effective strategy for spiritual formation. At the top of the new year, I really feel like this is an important thing for us to drill down into spiritual formation and to really uh, aim the rudder of the ship of our soul, so to speak, uh, towards maturity. But I want to start with some of your origin story, and we had a great chance to talk um, before we hit record here today, uh, but you've been a student of the scriptures for a long time, and I know you're working on a PhD currently, but take us inside. So I grew up, uh, went to Bible school at North Central University, where I, I began to really see myself as an academic because I saw that that interest was there. didn't really know I loved to study the Word until that time when, when you know, you're impressionable, you're young, and the the scriptures really started to fascinate me. At that point, I uh, graduated, went into full-time ministry and pastoral care. My academic interests were laid aside while I was doing pastoral care, um, six days a week probably, in inner city Detroit. Um, and then when I left that position, I was traveling full-time. Doors had opened for me to preach and, and do it internationally and nationally. I went to 47 countries and preached to a lot of different people groups. and. Um, but there was a moment in about 2013 where, you know, as a Pentecostal and a charismatic, I started to see that there was something missing in our movement. I didn't want to leave the movement. I wasn't one of these guys who felt it's time to leave Pentecostalism and become a cessationist. But I wanted to go deeper because I, I had been profoundly and deeply touched by the Brownsville movement, the Brownsville Revi revival in 96, 97 where I got filled with the Spirit and encountered profoundly, profoundly the, had the Pentecostal experience, as I call it. And um, that was so genuine that I, I couldn't leave that, but I wanted to add to it academia. I went to Moody Theological Seminary, got into a program where I learned exegetical Greek. That's a big word for saying I began working in the New Testament and examining it from the Greek to see what you can do with the text when you look at it at its rawest level. And then... Um, I thought some of the concepts were, were fun. I started to teach it on Instagram. Grew pretty good to where I published three books with Whitaker House on, you know, Greek, for, you know, different types of Greek devotionals and studies. And and then um, started a PhD at the University of Wales. Um, I had a moment when I was in Cambodia standing in the, um, the killing fields of Pol Pot where 110,000 people were killed and trying to rectify the goodness of God with the suffering of the innocent and to use the book of Revelation to do that. So um, I began uh, my thesis called The Exploration of Theodicy and Suffering in the Apocalypse of Pentecostal Engagement. And I'm on the tail end of that. So for five years, Chris, I've thought a lot about suffering. And uh, that's kind of the joke here at the OSU is Chris is the guy that comes to the party and everybody's having fun. He wants to talk about suffering. <laughs> so... What here we learned? are. Here what we are. What have you learned about suffering? I'm just going to go here then. What have you learned about suffering that has been absent <laughs> from a lot of um, our theology, especially those yep. of us in Pentecostal charismatic circles? Like, yeah. Yeah. I think that, so, spoiler alert, where I do believe I'm going to go, I haven't written my construction chapter yet. That means the chapter where I really go in there and tell you what I've been thinking, what I've come to learn for six years. But what I think, so let's, let me just throw out a big word here for some. It's called theodicy. Theodicy is a, a rational enterprise where you ex attempt to think about philosophically, it's not a theological term, it's a philosophical term. How do you bring those two together, God's goodness and, and, and the presence of evil or the question of suffering? And that is a, uh, that came from that that enterprise came around the 1700s, 1800s. Prior to that, you don't see a lot of talk about it, and I think that was for the better. That the project of theodicy, I think, is a cat's game. You're never going to give a rational explanation to suffering and the problem of evil. And I probably stand with the anti-theodicists and say that to give long fabricated explanations 
to justify and vindicate God, who never, who, who was never asked to be justified and vindicated in the first place by his creation, often creates more suffering and more sorrow for people. So you're doing yourself a disservice by trying to explain it elaborately. Yeah. So if we're not explaining suffering, so I would say that a lot of our, a lot of what we, not a lot, but what we preach today sometimes is a theodicy. I would critique the Word of Faith movement and say that it's very, it, it is a theodicy. It tries to explain suffering, um, and it often it takes God off the hook by, by oftentimes insinuating that He's not responsible. So guess who's responsible? Your inability to be led, or your lack of faith, or, and um, that's that's very harming, and it's a fabrication. If we wanted to go and talk about Job's friends. We could go explain. We could look at the lens of Job's friends, who, if we're talking narratively, I think are part of the story to serve as a foil. They're there to show Job's righteousness and his humility in approaching God by maybe their lack of humility and their lack of humility for trying to, for starting off with the presumption that they actually had the mind of God and could explain this mystery. There's something about mystery that I think Pentecostals charismatics and, and, and rational believers need to return to and accept that our faith is a great mystery and that we don't owe the rationalists an explanation. We don't owe the scientists an explanation for what we know and don't know about God. So you it's kind of where I'm at. You, you have a, opened up such a personal can for me and such a brilliant can because I don't know if you and I talked about this offline um, or even just chatting um, on Instagram or whatever, but so my mom battled cancer for 18 years. The folks here at the podcast know all about this and uh believe in the lord for a miracle saw extraordinary miracles well she ended up dying 10 years ago um 10 years ago last week uh 18 days after my 30th birthday um and it was oh, wow. like a, a, a gut punch right and i saw a couple things happen over the next six months many people were like see i told you you shouldn't play that faith game i told you the second thing is, well, brother, you know, he wor he works in mysterious ways, and he moves in mysterious ways. And I was like, no, God didn't say that. Bono said that. So here's where I'm landing, Chris, and I'm just <laughs> wondering, right? Like, if mm -hmm. we're talking about spiritual formation and growth today with you, maybe one of the things we could camp on for a moment with folks today, because this is such a relevant topic for all of us, is mystery. Do we need to just mature in... I don't know as an answer versus having yep. to rationalize a way through or uh, become God's attorney and give platitudes yep. and syrupy Christianese yep. that, that have no credence to them. What do you think? I, my answer to everyone over the last 10 years has been, I don't yep. know. <laughs> Mystery. Tell me That's more. And I don't think, yeah, my, well, I, first of all, Chris, you know, thank you for sharing that uh, about your mother and, I think that we have a book coming out at the OSU uh, in May, and I wrote a chapter on mystery. And what? And I used the example of a of a young lady. She's about twenty one when I was ministering in pastoral care, and she said she had lots of questions about her mom who, who who had died. And I guess in that chapter, I talk about how I felt that saying "I don't know" in those days of being word of faith was was the white flag of surrender it was defeatist to say that but now i have kind of flipped it 180 degrees and felt that saying i don't know is the most spiritual thing that i can do because by saying i don't know i'm relying on god and i'm trusting god and that probably is the most intimate thing that i can do is say that I serve this God in which really in reality there's a lot, I, I know enough to be saved, I know enough to call his son Jesus, but there's a lot I don't know. And the response, I think that's a deeply spiritual thing to do. And the response in times of sickness and disease isn't to deconstruct, isn't to offer platitudes, which are the worst, um, but is really to, yeah, using the book of Revelation um, as my, because I, I, that's the only book I worked in in this project. What I see is 
the role of the Holy Spirit in the book of Revelation is very interesting because you meet the Holy Spirit as the seven spirits of God in chapter one. You, you see him again in chapter five before the throne and the spirit is being sent out by the one who sits on the throne and by the lamb. And the, the Johannine community at that time would have understood that the spirit is active in the earth. So I think that the spirit is the answer that we need to have and rely on in times of suffering, not our rationale. And so how the Spirit uh, leads you to respond to people is not always an irrational answer. The Spirit, if someone's going through suffering, the Holy Spirit could put it in my heart to give them, I mean, this may sound simple, but to respond in compassion, acts of compassion, genuineness, Genuine acts of being there or doing things that the Spirit is leading that are genuine versus these oversimplistic things. Um, there was a time, let me make it practical, mm -hmm. where, you know, at my church, when I was pastoring, one of the worship leader's wife was sick. Um, and, and I think one of the people at our church just had it in their heart to send them food. And it seems simple and no big deal, but it was like the most, this just was what they needed and demonstrated to them that God is there and God loves them and God is working all things for their good. It's things like that, those responses and compassion, showing up to a funeral, being there for the person, especially those things God is leading you in particular to do, those things go way further. So my, my answer to suffer, so that's, that's sort of the short end of it, um, but certainly not trying to explain it. And, and trying to sympathize, trying to understand people and where they're at and their suffering. I mean, that's a good start. It's not the whole thing, but that's a good start. I mean, we could get into deeper forms of suffering that will go eventually all the way to Ali Wessel and the Holocaust, which I'll write about in my uh, in my thesis um, when he, you know, his book Night, where he talks about the Holocaust and his experience. I mean, if you want to talk about suffering, his book is chilling. I read the whole thing in one sitting because I couldn't put it down. But again, you have so he's wondering where God is, he sees a woman, or he sees a young boy aged about 12 hanging from the gallows, and that leads him to believe that God is dead. But then you have a woman like Corey Ten Boom who goes through the same experience, who's deeply, who deeply trusts in God. So these are deeper conversations, but certainly we can agree on in this podcast today um, that, that platitudes are probably... It's not a good idea. <laughs> well, it's really interesting because you, you tipped your hat to Job's friends. And, you know, if I read early on in the story after um, he shaves his head and um, his friends come to him, I think, in an appropriate fashion at first. They, they sit silently. They weep aloud. And I think that is such a, a, be yeah. a beautiful case study for us about what we need in times of grief. And, you know, folks today, we're not talking about grief, but we are talking about spiritual maturity. And, uh, Chris, like how many of us, instead mm -hmm. of presence, we just drop the platitudes and it does no good. You know, absolutely. What, what I'm learning is my idea of the prophetic has, has changed a little bit. The prophetic, when I was growing up in, in times of Brownfield, was, Thus saith the Lord, there's a revival coming. Um, and that's great, and it, that can be prophetic. But I also think that the ability to prophesy is the ability to tell the story and to tell it right and to tell it correctly. Now, we are all trying to make sense of our lives, and as human beings, we're storytellers. And the story that we're, we're, we tell the most often is the story of our lives that we tell to ourselves, right? And um, I think that when we mature and we begin to grapple with mystery, we the first lesson that we have to learn is not to always try to write the story immediately because we don't know yet what's going on. You know what I mean? And so, you know, so I think... That's where we make mistakes. I'll give you an example. Bless his heart. My dad, I was I was getting on an airplane, and I, I was going to Rome, and I was going to Rome the night before Thanksgiving. And that to me was, I, I love Thanksgiving Eve, I, and I wasn't sure if I should do it. You know, should I go to Rome? Should I not go to Rome? I shouldn't. And my flight, my first flight from Nashville to New York City gets canceled. So I call my dad, and I tell him, hey, you know, I'm canceled. I, I don't know how this, this isn't looking good right now. And he goes, well, maybe that's a sign from God that you shouldn't go. And so like that, that 
bothers me because it's like you're already trying to make meaning out of something that hasn't even played itself out just yet. And we do that all the time, right? We, we're almost fatalistic about how we tell the story. Um, and I think when the Holy Spirit becomes active in your life in a place of maturity, he helps and guides you to make sense out of the, the events that are taking place in your life versus trying to fabricate things that are just simply not true for yourself and for other people's lives. You know, someone comes, my husband left, my wife left, my spouse, my, my boyfriend broke up with me, my girlfriend broke up with me. And let me explain, let me tell you what that means. And it's like, wait a second, slow down for a minute and really hear from God before you start narrating a fabrication that has absolutely nothing to do with God and put that person on the wrong track and eventually put yourself into bondage. And so maybe being free and living free is getting free from fabrication as fabrications and narratives that we've been telling ourselves our whole lives that have zero to do with the story that the Holy Spirit is writing in our lives, you know? And that's the thing about Jesus that I think is so that's the thing about Jesus that I think is so profound is Jesus helped people to really make sense of things. And he, he was sense. He is faith. You know, I, I give this illustration. Your life is, uh, is our lives are a, a series of events that often seem random, you know, and it's sort of like, I like mystery books. So I kind of look at it like a mystery. You walk. Let's say you walk into a room, and as you open up the door, you notice that it's this something peculiar has happened. Well, how do you know? Well, because there's a lamp, and it's tipped over. There is a smoldering fire, and there's a book that's lying face down, where it's like someone had saved a place. And you know there is a footprint. You don't know what's happened in this room, but you know that somebody's been here and something is done and you have evidences of that. If a hundred people were to come in that room, a hundred people would tell that story differently. And so it's, it's coming to the place of finding out how do you put all those events together? Our lives are the same thing. This happens with my family. This happens with my job. This happens with this. This happens with that. How are you making sense of it? If we have a healthy mind that's led by that, that is sanctified, we have a better chance of making sense of it versus a mind that's not been renewed and a mind that is that is not um, under the, the the leadership of the spirit. And so I think in in the Job story, they're getting it all wrong about Job and they're making stuff up and it's not helping Job. It's causing him to suffer more. Right. And how often right. we do that. Yeah. So I think suffering. Um, so that goes all the way back to what you originally asked me. Um, when I, when you ask how we approach suffering, to be very delicate and not attempt to try to offer explanations because not knowing what to say is usually the indication that we shouldn't say anything at all because we don't we don't know the story well enough yet. Be there, help people, yeah. show genuine compassion, yeah. acts of service are good, you know, and that's about all you need to do. I don't necessarily want to put a period on a sentence that's not finished yet, but um, the question is burgeoning and it's this, then effective spiritual formation, effective growth, effective maturity requires what of us, Chris? I think it's, um, well, in light of what we're trying to say here, effective spiritual maturity requires trusting God enough to not know all the answers. And be okay with not knowing all the answers and finding ways to live in that, that resist, that resist making up a story that's just not so. Um, maybe people will resonate with that. Maybe they won't. I certainly, I'm not always trying to find meaning in everything all, all, all right away because I think hindsight helps us. We need hindsight. Oh, that's what God was doing. That's what was taking place. In the moment, I don't know. I'm not sure what all these clues mean. I don't know what the footprint means. I'm not sure why the book is on chapter three. I'm not sure why the, 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 the lamp is knocked over. But in time, I'll come to find out. But I'd rather wait for the story to be clear than for me to make up a story that's just not so. You know? So, I'm, so I think when I pray, I always pray and ask the Lord, Lord, help me not to live in false narratives that I'm telling myself. You know what I mean? Help me mm. to have the right perspective and to see life the way that it genuinely, genuinely is. I don't want to make up stories that aren't aren't the case, uh -huh. because that's how people get into all sorts of pitfalls. So I think God has to sanctify our imagination. 
God has to sanctify the way that we make meaning out of our lives. God has to sanctify the way that we make meaning out of events that take place. And I think that's deeply mature. Um, I love that. Not just cookie cutter mm-hmm. platitudes that we live in. Well, all things are working together for my good. And it's like we were living in that, but you're missing the profoundness of what's taking place in this moment in your life. That's it. You know. Uh, let's let's turn yeah. the page I on this. I hope that makes sense. It, it does, Chris. Let's turn the page on this just mm-hmm. for a moment, then, because if we're talking about uh, constructing false narratives, finding meaning that necessarily isn't there, jumping to conclusions, uh, let's take that exact framework and apply this to studying scripture. Then, how do we not do that? And this will back in the question about how to study well, and we'll, we'll get there. But how do we not do exactly what you just said when it yeah. comes to? studying the word because we do it too often well that's a great that would be a great that's a good next move here let's do it i think being self-aware is really helpful in a lot of areas being self-aware and i'm not a mental health um you know person i'm not a psychologist but i know enough to know that that i being self-aware is probably a good thing like but i also think that being aware of who we are when we read scripture nobody everybody brings something to the text even if even if you want to be the most purely pure hermeneutics we all bring something to the text because we're contextual theologically i come from a context and i'm bringing something to the text i might be bringing my american identity to the text i might be bring, i'm bringing my perspective to the text i'm american italian i'm going to bring that to the text americans aren't the only ones that do it though i mean i don't Okay, so if you're if you're from a country in Africa, if you're from a country in age, you're gonna bring that to the text. I'll give you an example. When I teach first year home students, this is the this is the smoking gun when students disagree with me on this. I always tell them, we're gonna talk about contextual theology. What's that mean, Prof? It means you notice things in the text other people don't notice, or you overlook things in the text that other people don't overlook based upon who you are in your life experience. So I always have a student get up and tell me tell me the story of this prodigal son. Okay. Well, first of all, I remember one time somebody said, "Well, the prodigal son gets to the point his friends tell him to go back." So then I say, you know, where does it talk about friends in the story of the prodigal son? Right. So right away they've made up the fact that he has friends. There's no friends in there. He just ends up going back. But every every person I have ever asked in a class has always failed to notice one detail in the text. And that is part of the reason why the prodigal son goes back. The catalyst for him going back was that there was a famine in the land and nobody ever tells that detail ever. I've never heard it preached one time in the story. It's almost irrelevant to us. But did you know that people who have had and lived through famine tend to notice that detail more than we have in the Western United States? And that's because we don't we don't really know what fam- famine to us is if our stocks drop 100 points, you know. And so we've always been a land of abundance. So so I think that's enough to prove. It doesn't make us worse readers or better readers than the people that are in the East or the people that have been through famine. But it does prove the point that we tend to subconsciously see things or miss things when we read. So I think that – and that's not our fault. And that's not to blame. We're not – I'm not here to say that we're bad readers. But what it does is it tells us that – we need to be aware of that when we read scripture and do our best to accept that and to try to read the scripture to offset those sorts of things as well as to really follow the text. I also think that, you know, hermeneutically speaking, there's ways to approach. We could get into I won't get I won't jump to the hermeneutic conversation, but I will I'll, I'll end this part of the conversation by saying just being aware and knowing who we are when we read scripture. And uh, yeah, I think it's a good start. Chris, we were talking about being aware of our woundedness and how uh, our woundedness shapes our biases mm-hmm. about Scripture. Anything we need to know about that yeah. and what we yeah. bring to um, our study? Well, again, that goes back to our experiences. I think that uh, people deconstruct because they're wounded. Um, they're looking for things because they're upset. So, so knowing where you're wounded at. Prayer is a good place to start before reading Scripture to offer to the Lord your wounds before you start reading the Bible, lest you read it wrong and end up in a really bad place and weaponize the scriptures um, to say something that God didn't intend or not even to And I also think, you know, Chris, that um, reading with a compassionate heart, not to, to not browbeat people to prove yourself right or correct. Um, I, I think I always say this, 
we're doing theology right if it leads us to two things, humility and love. If we're doing those things correct and the fear of God, humility, love, and the fear of God, if it leads us into those three things, we are reading scripture correctly and we're doing theology right. If it leads us away from those things, something's off. It could it could certainly be a wound that's causing us to miss those things. So, um, you know, if I'm reading and I'm studying and mm-hmm. I start to feel proud that there's something in me that, that needs correction, needs prayer. And, and the same with the love, the fear of God. If I'm reading, I'm trying to find something to justify sin. I'm reading the wrong way. Um, it, otherwise, you end up with moralizations of Scripture. You don't want to just use Scripture to moralize. I'm better than you. This is the moralization. You shouldn't do this. You should do Yeah, and it goes on and on. But woundings, knowing who you are, your, your, social, your social identity. I mean, I won't go down that path. But yes, I think those are good, really practical places to start. And then also a good place to start is to read Scripture in community. Um, I think that Pentecostals have it right in this area when they, Pentecostal hermeneutics today is at a place where they're really leery of private interpretations of the text, where the, the, the interpretation needs to be done within the community. Um, you know, this whole idea of Bible studying the Word or coffee with Jesus, it's given, it's opened up the temptation to have individualized interpretations of Scripture where my reading's right and your reading's wrong. And when they say things like inerrancy, they're not really saying that when they use this term inerrancy, what they're really saying is that my interpretation of the scripture is right. And if you disagree with my interpretation, you disagree with the inerrancy of the text. Um, and that's that's so off. I mean, that's that's a horrible way to treat scripture. So uh, there's something about having a community that you're reading with um, that's very important. That, of course, that begins with church denominations. I don't know how it goes. So. What are some of your favorite study resources, Chris? Any specific titles that you recommend that we get a hold of? I'm a big believer. This is the conversation you and I had a month ago about uh, Keener's Spirit Hermeneutics, yeah. and you know, I just I love that conversation we had. Um, but I'd love to know yeah. some of your favorites that we just mm-hmm. need to be good students of the words to study to show ourselves approved. Yeah. So um, commentaries are always a lot of fun. They're good. I think people should realize there's three different types of commentaries. There, you have your uh, practical pastoral commentaries. You have your moderate commentaries, and then, then you have your critical commentaries. Critical commentaries are like your exegetical ones, New, Inter- New International Greek Testament commentary, NIGTC, or the, the, the Hebrew, uh, the Old Testament version of that, Old Testament commentary. Uh, then you have the Yale Anchor Bible. These are technical, highbrow ones that are master's level work. Um, then you you have pastoral commentaries which are more pastoral then you have expositor commentaries who are trying to help the preacher so there's all different types of commentaries that are worth getting into um i think that i will say this if you're doing if you, there's a difference between being a theologian and a biblicist a biblicist is somebody who actually can get into the text and work in the text theologians don't usually always get into the text a theologian might talk about Karl Barth's dogmatics and compare that with you know Bootman and compare that with whoever, and and they're never really talking about the text. They're talking about the ideas of people. Now you're doing theology, but me as a biblicist, commentaries. I think it's worth people's time to take to maybe learn learn a biblical language that they can. But all this is is real highbrow type stuff mm-hmm. for the average person. I encourage Bible reading, spending time reading the Bible, um, and I mean monographs are good. You could look at uh, Keener's Spirit Hermeneutics. is certainly a, a hermeneutics book that's teaching you how do you read with the help of the Spirit. But he has his he has his critics on that book. I mean, his his critics are people like John Christopher Thomas and um, Robbie Waddell, who would say, "Well, there's other there's this is what you missed in that book," and and maybe jumping into those conversations and kind of seeing what people said. It helps, it certainly helps, but. There's a wide world out there, and whatever, whatever. I always just say, fan, fan your interests, follow where your interests are leading you, because sometimes your interests could be the Holy Spirit showing you where to go. Um, at good. the moment, I'm reading Dostoevsky's Corpus, so I'm trying to get through his five his five books. Wow. Um, and and I, I, there's something that, yeah, I'm almost almost there though, I'm getting hmm. there about halfway through. Um, but he's deep, and I think that there's something about liter so. Um, I'll say this, uh, Chris. In theology lately, people have been doing visual theology because um, 
in other words, they've been bringing art into the picture. Like instead of reading commentators from the 13th century, they may, they may look at pieces of art from the 13th century because they feel like, hey, a rational critical mind isn't seeing the whole perspective on the book of Revelation. Let's look at a 14th century piece of art uh, as, as as something that's theological to see what the left brain versus the right brain sees in the text. And so that's becoming a way of doing theology we never really thought about. And I think that's helpful to an extent. I wouldn't go all the way with that, but it's helpful because, you know, Dostoevsky is literature, and there's a lot of theological themes that are running through his stuff, especially his book, um, Crime and Punishment, in the end. It's very redemptive, and actually the whole book, it takes you through this psychological journey, and then in the end, it ends with the book of the Gospel of John and the fourth gospel. It's like, where did this come from? But there's so many theological themes running through that. Um, I would say, if people have theological interests, um, classic literature is a really cool place to explore those, to see those types of works through Christian eyes. Um, when I was reading, um, I was reading the existentialist philosophers over the summer, and at the end of those, as, as dreaded as they were, I didn't need a cosmic reason or cosmic proof to believe in God. I had an existential reason to believe in God because this is yes. sort of what happens when you try to create your own meaning. And, and God's not the one giving you meaning. You end up like you end up like his protagonist. So, mm -hmm. anyway, that's a good way at it. So, so for the majority of listeners who are just um, deeply interested but may not know, and folks, listen, I, I do mean this with the greatest respect. Maybe some folks just don't know where to start when it comes to deeper than the Bible I have in my hand. You know, do you have one or two specific titles of commentaries? Uh, maybe a, a good New Testament commentary that would serve people well, that would be a great addendum to study? Yeah, I think the NIV application commentary is really good. That's a great place to start. I know people will boo the NIV, but I'm, I'll stand for the NIV. I, I think that there's a place for all these. I don't think anybody's done anything malevolent. NIV application t commentary um, is, a, is a good place to start. Um, for the deeper student that wants to go deeper, I always recommend the Yale Anchor Bible Commentary. Brazos commentary series is probably the most ecumenical. The Brazos Commentary Series is good. Um, those would be good places to start. They're expensive, but uh, not too expensive. Go through it book by book. Those are great, great places to start. It gets some background information um, and begin there. Chris, I love that because you, you mentioned the NIV application commentary. Um, and I'll just go right here and ask you about translations then. A lot of people maybe are a little overwhelmed by the myriad of translations available. Do you favor one over the other? I'll give you an example. Like for me personally, I grew up on Amplified to be just candid with you. Um, yeah. The church I grew up in, my pastor to this day still preaches New King James. Um, today I lean towards ESV, but do you have a, a preference? Mm -hmm. Do you tend to lean one way over the other formal versus dynamic? What do you think? I just love to learn. Uh, so formal is great. I, I use formal. I use ESV or NASB. I, I'd always recommend formal because of I, because I'm into trend. I work in the Greek because you want something that's more formal. But I do, I, I love I love dynamic. I mean I love going and seeing what the meaning is because that there's, that's translation too. And if we're doing that, I love I love the NLT. I absolutely love it. So. I think there's a place for I think there's a place for everything that's that we have and I'm not a passion translation guy but I don't think that's a translation and I'm sorry to throw that under the bus right here now I think that if you if you treat the passion as a commentary and you see it as a commentary I can live with you doing that um, but let's not call it translation and I think the message Bibles I think that yeah I think the message Bible is a little different. In that, I'm not going to get on. I don't want to get into a rant here. So, but there's a place for there's a place for all, and yeah, enjoy. Mm. Don't don't get too. I would I wouldn't be so dogmatic about all that. I, I wouldn't tell anybody. Be, don't That's don't good. be dogmatic. I I think we can. You know, I don't want to pick bones with all the translations. I'm just not there. So, yeah. There's a, there's a lesson um, that I I hear often in in great conversations like this and. Perhaps this goes back to our commentary about maturity and mystery and uh, being willing to eat the meat and throw out the bones. Um, and I, mm -hmm. I, I think that's helpful for people to understand, for me to understand, you know, in this conversation, to eat the meat, throw out the bones, to celebrate people for who they are, 
uh, without stumbling over who they're not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that people, when we talk about eat the meat and spit out the bones or eat the sticks and spit out, or eat the hay and spit out the sticks, um, I a hundred percent agree with that. But I also, I also think that sometimes if I can amend this to the next level, sometimes a, sometimes what might taste like a stick at first might just be a tougher piece of hay that you have to chew on a little longer, you know? So that to me, um, is what I sort of learned that if I immediately don't agree with it, it might just be because I like the way soft hay tastes and I don't have an appetite yet for, for this. So it's, unless the Holy Spirit's giving you witness of this, or it's, you may have to chew on that just a little bit longer and be willing to, to go with it. Um, and I've, I've had to learn that over time. And so, um, I challenge people to do that, especially students like, hey, some of, some of my students, when they write their discussion board posts and they immediately go in on things and I see that they're wrong and they're proof texting it, I'm like, okay, how do, we, how do I help this student, this student to reevaluate what, where they're at? Because I was there. I, I've been there um, without them thinking I'm a heretic. And so I play the devil's advocate. And I used to have a, a professor who I thought was a universalist until the day I graduated. And then he finally told me he wasn't, and he told me what he believed, and I thought, you know, but he was a good professor because he really played the devil's advocate on me and made me think through everything that I believed. And so I, I guess I'm fine being that to some people, the devil's advocate, <laughs> trying to push back on some. <laughs> Any, anything else you yeah. want to say about that, Chris, about, hey, maybe – the stick that we're chewing on, actually, we just need to stick with. Is there anything tactically or practically that we can learn from an application perspective about sticking with things? That, yeah, if you disagree, great learning if, in this. If you, if you disagree with something when you're reading, you need to explain why. Like somebody needs to, you have to really explain this, why I disagree with this. So in a paper, if a student says, I disagree with X, Y, and Z, I'm going to form a series of questions around that that make them think critically about why they're saying that. And if they can't give me reasons for that other than they just don't believe in it, they need to really evaluate whether or not they know what they're talking about. <laughs> Same here. And that comes from writing a thesis. I mean, writing a thesis is constructing 100,000 words, one right after the next, where they all make sense and fall into play. And you can support every single sentence that you have actually said. That's why I tell students, like, the thing about a thesis is, is that you've never thought about something this hard and this long in your life. And you're trying to make yourself consistent. So when you form questions around, so someone says, oh, this, is, this, is, this here is a stick. Well, how do you know it's a stick? Well, it doesn't taste like all the other hay. Well, how do you know all hay tastes the same? How do you know you've tried all the hay? How do you know that there's not hay from another bale that's just as nourishing? And then it makes them think, well, hmm. Well, maybe, the, and so you, you form critical thinking about it. And so, and then I would say, okay, go do your research. I'll give you the sources. Here's this, 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 and this. Look it up. Maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. You may find that you're right. Well, guess what? You've learned something. Now you've learned why you're right. I mean, um, uh, uh, what is his name? Mortimer J. Adler has a book called How to Read a Book. The book's called How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler. And he, he talks about in there, there's a difference between being informed and being enlightened. The person that's informed is, is able, has heard something, is able to repeat that. Therefore, he's informed. The person who is enlightened has heard something, can repeat it, but in addition to just repeating it, can tell you why it's true and why it's the case. And that's enlightenment versus being informed. And so it's the difference between it's a difference between hearing a song on the radio and being able to tell me the lyrics of the song versus knowing the musical composition of the song, why the writer wrote that song, what the lyrics of the song are actually speaking to, and and how to play that song themselves. So I think that so I, so there's 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 one thing I've heard I've heard it at church. Now I can preach it, or now I can say it. Now I actually I sound smart. But if I bring in the critical thinking and start questioning you about that, if you can't go any further, you don't know it. You, you just you have talking points. That's not enlightenment. Enlightenment is knowing why it's the case 
and being able to go in different directions with what you're talking about. That's powerful. So then, Chris, how do we determine in Scripture um, what is descriptive versus prescriptive, like as we read? Is there a tool, is there a hermeneutic, uh, a tool that we could use and apply? Well, I think, yeah, so there's different hermeneutical uh, approaches to the text, which I don't know if I'll have time to, to lay out all of those. Well, let me say this. I'll, I'll say this. We, my One of my profs used to say, we learn by precept and we learn by example. I think that one of the mistakes that we make is if it's not stated obviously, like a in the sky, then we're like, well, it's not in scripture. Mm, I disagree. For instance, in the fourth gospel, it's everywhere that Jesus is the son of God. That's the whole reason he wrote. But maybe a Jehovah's Witness who comes door to door was like, he never said he's the son of God. Well, you know, maybe he didn't say it the way he didn't walk up to somebody and say, hello, I'm Jesus. I am the son of God. Let me define to you what I mean by that. Blah, 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 blah. But there's enough in there where he's absolutely making claims. Uh, I go, hey, me, the I am speech. I am the bread of life. I am the door. The, all the I am, the 10 I am statements. The seven I am statements or 10 in John where he uses the term ego me. Um, that's enough to give us that. So I think there, there are ways of looking at what's being said. It's not always, there's the insinuations, the nuances, the those aspects of scripture that are, are saying without being so much stated, but saying it in a more powerful way. Uh, for instance, in the book, I always talk about this in the book of Matthew, right? You have um, he, chapter one, Jesus is introduced the first time in the New Testament as Emmanuel, God with us. In Matthew chapter 28, Lo, I'm with you always, even to, even to the end of the earth. And then Matthew 18, where Jesus says, um, where two or more that gathered together, there am I in your midst. I mean, three, I am with you. Two, two of which book and the entire book, one which falls in almost the dead center of the book. I think the message, even though Matthew never says it by writing in the sky, is that Jesus is with us because God sent him to us. He's been sent from heaven, like the song goes, to earth, right? And through the abiding presence of his spirit, he remains with us. And that's not explicitly stated, but that's prescriptive. We know he's with us. His, he is here through the presence of the spirit. Jesus is, is here with us through his spirit. So it's, um, yeah, it's, I don't think we should qualify how the biblical writers should speak. I think we should come to understand how the biblical writers should speak and then fall in line with what they're doing versus saying they must say it this way, like maybe some Jehovah's Witnesses would do, maybe we would do. Maybe the follow-up question to that then is, what are a few things that we tend to do incorrectly when it comes to study that we don't know, in fact, are incorrect? Like we, We're just in a habit of doing this, and I know it's a generalization, um, but things we should yeah. be aware of that mm -hmm. we, can, we can correct, because you've given us a ton to chew on today. Awesome. I'm happy. I, I, so I'm not, I won't pick wrong things, but I'll just say like better ways of doing things. Um, one of the ways that I think the more noble, I think it seems noble to people is that if I'm going to prove something from scripture, I'm going to give you as many scriptures on it as I possibly can. And I don't, I don't particularly like that go at it, even though some good this systematic theology books are written that way, Gruden's the systematic, Mildred Erickson's systematic, they're written that way. But what the problem with that is, and it's not their fault, but maybe the problem with that is, is students get used to doing theology by piling up verses on certain things and then saying, look, it says it right there. Um, I think when I'm with, when I have my students with me, I'm like, okay, look it, let's take something from John and let's talk about it. But you can't go outside of John, not right now. Stay in John, because I want to understand how John thinks about this. I want to see what he's saying. And then when you do that, you'll realize John has a language that he's speaking. There's, he has phrases that are familiar to him and don't import, don't import what, Peter's language is into, into John's language. Let me, let me give you an example. I first started doing my thesis. I first started doing my thesis. And I and this wasn't the big thing. I spent weeks, Chris, thinking about this. What am I going to call Christians in the book of Revelation? So I turn in a section of my thesis to my advisor. He's hot. He's mad. Not, he's like irritated. Chris, why are you calling them? Why are you calling them God's new covenant community? 
why are you calling them um, the New Covenant community? And I'm like, well, what's wrong with that? That is not Johannine. That is Pauline. And you've been reading N.T. Wright, haven't you? I have. Yeah, that's how, that's N.T. Wright's language for referring to how Paul refers to believers in his letters. What is it doing in your thesis? And why are you using to describe John's stuff? You need to take language that is Johannine and use it in John. <laughs> so it, that was the, that what gave me the example that, oh my gosh, he's right. I am talking about something John talked about using somebody else's language. It's like saying, it's like me talking the way, it's like me talking about something using language that Nathan Finocchio would use or using language that, um, the way that Rod Parsley talks about something, you know, it's it's just not me. It's it's not them. So what I ha- and it tells me like if I'm going to do this, I need to think like John, not Paul. But but then people are like, yeah, well, the Bible, you know, is all the same. Well, it is God's written revelation to us. But to get the most out of it, we need to learn how the thinker was thinking about it, and then we take those ideas and we see how they come together because they're not going to conflict. But they, they're going to have various, there's going to be a richness to it that you lose if you start putting it all, jumbling it all together. So what I started calling them was hearers. Because the Spirit says, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So they're hearers. And that was like, oh yeah, okay. The Johanna community, they're hearers. So all that to say, when you're reading a, a book of the Bible, if you're reading Paul, stay within Paul. If you're reading Ephesians, work within Ephesians. And then if you're going to move out of it, go to the next book over. Go to Colossians, go to Philippians. And if you're going to move, then go to the other letters. If you're going to read Luke, well, then go to Acts first. And then go to the gospel, the other narratives first, and see how all that fits in. Another way that you could do is to understand the Old Testament. I mean, the, this 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 is the game changer. My favorite class when I had seminary, and I think my favorite class in Theo Seminary that we offer to the master students is a class I teach called the use of the New Test the use of the Old Testament in the New, understanding how the biblical writers in the New Testament made use of the Old Testament. And there are a lot of rich surprises about how they take the language of the old and they bring it into the new in many places where they're not quoting. One of the examples I always use in my classes is for instance when in, in Matthew chapter five, I think it is when Jesus walks up to the Mount uh, of Olives to teach the Beatitudes, the way it's described, Matthew describes it in a way where he sounds like Moses going up onto Sinai. And so, if that is the case, if he's echoing that Moses is going up in the Sinai, what is this saying about what is how he understands Jesus that he is now taking the place of Moses and now he's about to give regulations and rules and laws except these are going to be the ones that are higher than Moses and so we're supposed to see Jesus now as the new Moses walking up sitting down and teaching the people the way that the law instructed the people of God and that changes the game so it's things like that man my wheels are spinning because I love the scriptures and I love teaching and I love helping people grow and develop but Man, what you are giving us today is uh, so worthwhile. Chris, I'll land here uh, in today's conversation. It's sort of where we started. Word and spirit, how do we marry the two once again in truth um, for the glory of the Lord again in, in, in today's church? Okay, so let's talk to the theology nerd first. The theology nerd, my instruction to the theology nerd is you need to have a robust prayer life. You need to spend time in prayer. Put your Logos Bible software away. Put your commentaries on the shelf for a while and get on your face and get before Jesus. And worship Him. Thank Him. Rejoice. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in tongues. Speak to yourself in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. This is not a time to dot the I's and cross the T's. This is a time to worship. It's a time to just welcome and invite and be still in the presence of God. And in, in that time, supplicate, pray for other people. Pray for the people that the Holy Spirit puts on your heart so that you can feel how God feels towards lost, broken mankind. Um, when you do that kind of stuff, you're less apt to become a cold, um, 
out of touch theologian who, who can't feel what people are feeling and you're, if, because if you become that you're, you're good for nothing and number two roll up your sleeves and get involved in your church and be involved in the work of god if you don't do those two things you you just you, theology is no different from stamp collecting and playing bingo it's just a hobby to you you know it's good for nothing to the um the the ultra charismatic person who is um out here preaching and prophesying and has no regard for theology. Um, <laughs> what would I tell that person? Where do I start? To, where do I start with that guy um, or gal? I would say that the gospel that we preach, the Bible that we preach, was given to us by careful, careful scribes who were scholars. And we owe them a debt. And that is to ourselves pass along now we're not sitting there with a quill and pen but we're telling the story of god and we need to make sure that we follow their example by teaching with the same accuracy and we're not going to teach that way unless we give ourselves to the text and to pouring over the text as students and 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 the and, you know charismatics have a way of pointing at the calvinists and saying that they're proud charismatics are just as proud in a different way and that is they think that the Holy Spirit is going to give them everything and they don't want to change the way they view and they're right about everything. But look at humility means saying I'm wrong about something. Okay, you've preached it a hundred times, but don't don't preach it a hundred and first time. You're wrong about it. Stop preaching it this way. Think about it a different way. Listen, if you're preaching with the power of the Spirit, you'll become unstoppable. I don't mean that in, a, in an arrogant way, but I mean that you'll become a real blessing is if you can preach with power and teach just like a technician in a way that just makes the scriptures come alive for people, makes the story come alive, makes Jesus come alive. And you don't get that without study. You don't get that without hours and hours of sitting there. Because I look at it this way. When I'm studying, that's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Not always just prayer, but studying. That's sitting at his feet. And so look at your study time to sitting at the feet of Jesus. And, um, you know, it's not always... You know, you don't always hear worship music and the angels of heaven singing. You don't always feel um, goosebumps when you do it, but it honors God. Chris, anything else that you want to leave with the listeners today? I've got so much more I could ask you, but uh, I think this is all the time we have. <laughs> no, well, 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 let me just thank you for, for having me on, Chris. And like oh, I said, boy. I think when we first started chatting, two guys from Michigan whose name is Chris, we're, we're brothers. It's meant to be. So to That's be good. on this podcast has, has been my honor. Ah, what a joy. Um, Chris, I'd love for people to just head your way in terms of specific uh, points to reach you and get a hold of you and connect with your resources. Is there any particular place where you house everything outside of Lake Theos? Yeah, uh, they go to chrispalmer.me, um, and my resources are available there. They can pick up my books and stuff I've written up to this point. Um, and then my Instagram is at Chris Palmer. My Twitter, not now that Elon's owning Twitter, I guess it's cool again <laughs> to say Twitter, so my Twitter's at Chris Palmer. Yeah, that's so good. <laughs> Folks, what did I tell you? This is the very first episode of 2023, and, and this was really my desire, guys, to get us headed in a, in a direction where we are calibrating the affections of our hearts to King Jesus and really studying to show ourselves approved. And, and here we go. 2023 is here. But, Chris, I thank you for your time, for your wisdom. This has been a gift. My pleasure. My pleasure.